just getting live in Facebook and now I'm going to admit all people don't um, many people are going to arrive probably late so just for you to know okay Hello everyone, uh, this is um, very excited today. This is uh, an event that we have been planning, I think since last year, and you know, we wanted to do this type of event where we are featuring actually, uh, you know, some of the um, entrepreneurs we have that are, you know, uh, gender-based women that they are uh, also bringing companies to Canada. Uh, this, this one are doing amazing things uh, here in Canada and we mean to do this in March last year with some of them, but it was, uh, it didn't happen because of the pandemic and everything. And this year, well, uh, we're putting together finally this year. Uh, so we are, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce a group of uh, women entrepreneurs that are part of the Startup Visa program and that uh, have take the courage and really bold movement as many other entrepreneurs that we have in our programs to bring their companies into uh, Canada. So I want to welcome each of them and I'm going to introduce, uh, let them introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with Ingrid Polini. Uh, Ingrid, uh, please introduce yourself. Of course, hi everyone, uh, I'm Ingrid. I'm the CEO for Safety Dogs. I've been living in Canada around three years, but we started with the Startup Visa program just now in January. Uh, and we start our spin off uh, in November last year in Canada. So pretty new to, to all this. Thank yeah, you. no, thank you so much, Ingrid. Uh, Raquel, uh, you can introduce yourself. Yes, of course. Thank you, Miriam. Hi, everyone. Well, my name is Raquel Buesa. I'm here in Canada since 2019. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I already um, actually incorporated and accelerated in Latin startups, two startups. And I'm also an entrepreneur in Brazil for more than 20 years. And now I'm leading Artemis Project Expansion to Brazil. It's a woman on the move project and uh, to let and help women entrepreneurs to connect with the mining industry. That's amazing, Raquel. You have done too many things in this, uh, this year, so it will be great to hear from you as well. Uh, Beatriz, uh, you can introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Beatriz Anatelli. I'm co-founder and CEO of Light Touch Technologies. We started off with the LATAM program back in uh, engaging in Toronto back in 2018. We started the progress as, and the program on 2019. So we're very excited with the launch coming up now. Yeah, thank you, Beatriz. And then we have Juliana too. Juliana, are you here? Yeah, hi, how hey. are you? Hi. Uh, my name is Juliana, as Miriam say. I came from Colombia uh, last year since the pandemic started. Uh, I I am co-founder from call makers. So let's get started. Yeah, thank you so much, Juliana. So uh, ladies, we are going to start with a difficult topic for many entrepreneurs around the world. Uh, 2020 was a really a shock for many people, you know, for the whole world uh, with the pandemic, and especially for entrepreneurs, we have to rethink over and over what we have to do in regards of business. Uh, some of you are, uh, you know, mothers, uh, you, you have families, some others, you have been, uh, you know, working very hard in your own uh, companies. Uh, either way, you have, you know, kids or no, uh, kind of the company become a kid for many, many people. How did you uh, do in 2020 and in this year to cope with the pandemic as entrepreneurs? What type of strategies you put together to keep, keep up with your company? and expanding in Canada, because that was a kind of a bold move for, for all of you. Who wants to start with an answer? Yeah, I can start, Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, um, it, it was a very bold move, I, I think, for um, every entrepreneur as a whole. Uh, and of course, for women, I would say it's a little bit more challenging with the COVID uh, hitting at our doors and having to, you know, have kids at home full time, being a school mom, 
um, homeschooling them. In my case, uh, I have a child, I have a six-year-old. So uh, I would say chaotic, but it was exciting because uh, at least I was able to confront um, my own limits and I got to realize how actually how strong I am. So, and it's an opportunity for us to reinvent ourselves as a whole. So I think it was a good opportunity for uh, self-discovery. What did you do in particular, Beatrice, in order to, uh, you know, sustain your company here? Like, um, uh, were you more in contact with mentors, with other people? What, what was your strategy in order to keep up? Yes, uh, we are part of uh, a few accelerating programs. So we kept very strong on that end. So um, the most feedback that we receive the best. So be being engaged in this community keeps us sane as well. Uh, keeps adding us good tips of business and um, other, I, I think just trying to um, look with optimism in every situation that we gain and try to see everything on the bright side. Like if we look from my perspective as an ed tech, we can look at the bright side also because of the pandemic. So try to just take the best out of it. Right, that's very important. Uh, thank you so much, Beatriz. Ingrid, how was your experience? Because you really started the program during the pandemic. It was in September. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> how was your experience doing all this and bringing the company? Because your company is from Brazil. So uh, yeah, tell us about that. Of course. Uh, so there's a couple aspects there. I think that like for one thing, it helped us in the sense that I live on the other side of Canada. I live in West Coast. So it helped me a little bit in the sense of like everyone getting online and me not having to move in order to participate in all the programs and all the events that usually happen more on the East Coast. Uh, regarding the pandemic, I think that there was a big aspect of bringing my team together, especially because most of my team uh, is so in Brazil while we do the internationalization and with them working from home or having me as an entrepreneur having to accompany not just what's happening in Canada, but in Brazil as well and taking decisions in both places, uh, it ends up being very challenging, like uh, maintaining the same schedule, right? Because I, I work with three time zones, basically, with the, Van with the Vancouver one, with the Toronto one, and then with Brazil. Um, so just uh, managing all that and managing teams while every, everything is happening and having compassion for people too, right? Because uh, situations in other countries, for example, Brazil, are very complicated with COVID right now. So having to understand what is, um, how to manage people as well as bringing the business here was the biggest challenge in organizing all that. Um, how did you do that in particular, uh, Ingrid? Uh, like, uh, did you have some tools around you or it was more like a teamwork that you organized because you are the CEO right now of the company. Uh, you are also a very young person, like uh, trying to organize a, a, a team is very challenging for any type of person that is in, in, in charge of a company. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Of course. Uh, so I think that one advantage that I had was that I, were, I was already managing all those people working from here because I, I moved to Canada and I was managing them remotely. Uh, a couple of the tools I use is that I, I do a daily with them every day in the end of the day to know what they did during the day. So all the team, especially working from home office, the whole team knows what everyone is working in and they can align with each other as well as having like boards for whatever you can imagine. So we have Trello boards, we use a lot of Trello. So like with all the information for IT, all the information for uh, customer service, connecting directly with them through Teams, but trying to not overdo it as well. Cause they see uh, one thing that I've heard from other people in companies is that they try so hard to connect all the time that that ends up plummeting um, productivity, right? Because if you have to all the time connect to a new meeting, you really don't have the time to process and deal with information. So I think it's a, it's a balance there. Yeah, it's a balance and it's very challenging to do it. So congratulations for that. Uh, Juliana, how was your experience? You, <laughs> you actually arrived during the pandemic, like uh, two weeks before, I think everything was closing up here. Uh, so how was your experience and how did you cope with all this, uh, this part of, uh, you know, managing a company here? Well, yes, uh, my experience has been uh, positive because people are more open to know uh, other people's experience. So here in Canada, people doesn't, uh, don't matter where you are come from. So this, for me at least, allows uh, to do many connections and did did this these situations when you do uh, so many connections you you are allowed to 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 grow so has been very positive for us. 
Okay, uh, but at the beginning, uh, I remember this was a shock for everyone, you know, kind of entering into lockdowns, uh, you know, in your case, uh, uh, I remember you guys were planning to have actually in presence events, and this kind of changed everything. How did you cope with the new strategy? How did you get into that new strategy, uh, you know, and to put Kini, for example, online and, and perhaps you can talk a little bit about Kini because, uh, you know, probably the audience doesn't know a little bit about that, like uh, about the company. <laughs> oh yeah, well, uh, we, we, we are into the ed tech company. We, we create Kini, which is a robot for, for kids. Uh, well, I didn't bring it to me today. Uh, but yeah, as you were saying at the beginning, we were all, I mean, in Colombia, we were doing all, all activities face to face. Uh, but then when we arrive, uh, everything showed that, uh, showed, showed down. So in that moment was very hard, were, was, uh, very hard for us, but then we started to do, uh, all the activities online. So it was, uh, better for us because the situation, uh, we were, uh, saving more, uh, we were saving a lot of time to, to do all the activities. So I think we, we, that 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 situation the pandemic was uh really good for us no i agree with that it was it was very hard uh you know at the time trying to modify everything thank you juliana and raquel uh how was your, your experience because you actually become permanent resident uh i think it was at the end of 2019 right yes it was in october to times October. yeah, yeah. And uh, well, I'm a single mother. I came with my daughter to Canada, all the, only the two of us. So for sure, the pandemic was very challenging for us. She was studying from home. She's 12 years old now. Uh, so she was studying from home. I have to motivate her, engage her with her studies, uh, take care of her in the house and manage my businesses. So this was challenging for sure. At the same time, I can say that um, I could use more um, my my I could value my time more. So I was much more productive. Every minute counted to, so much for me that I think I I reduced a lot of my time to make decisions uh, with a more assertive way to do it, organizing my to-do lists and organizing with systems, doing weekly meetings with my co-founders and partners in a way that we would be more assertive to actually develop um, activities all very well divided. So these were things that we, we, we got better during this pandemic. And also we had the opportunity to open doors in other countries. So now I am advising and um, actually mentoring companies from Nigeria, from Colombia. I'm doing a, a program that is called Think Global with other three partners with Afal Pinto. I think he is here today and uh, with Cleverson and Rogério uh, in a lot of countries. So we are in Ecuador, we are in Colombia, Argentina. Um, uh, we are developing partnerships in places that I would not imagine uh, before the pandemic. Um, and even here with Artemis doing the expansion to Brazil and I am in Toronto, uh, it's a possibility to connect both countries uh, and everybody's open for online meetings. I think before the pandemic, there were resistance. There were like uh, mo moments that people were just waiting to do in-person meetings. So they were not open for that. And now they are. So I think if you, if you see these opportunities and you're ready to go. So what I did, I, I tried to use as better as I could LinkedIn content, connections um, with strategy, thinking about how I could connect in a very good way, people that were important to me, value these relationships and, and do continuous follow-up and show what I was doing, uh, enhance my reputation with this great connection. So I think uh, building our, our network here uh, because when you we come from another country, I have 
20 years of business in Brazil. So my network in Brazil is huge. But here I was just starting, it's like rebuilt and reborn again. So I think this time I could I could reorganize this the things. Got it. Uh, so the next question is, uh, is more about, you know, many uh, I hear, for example, during the pandemic and, and even now, you know, there are too many people uh, that are closing business or they are returning to basically their homes and they are uh, trying to rethink what they are going to do, rethink what, what, you know, what the future will expect for them in regards either personal or business wise. Um, in your case, what make you continue doing the expansion that, that you are doing? Why, what was the motivation behind? I want to start with Ingrid. Ingrid, what was your motivation behind to continue doing it, even though the circumstances were not the best? I think there's a couple for me. To be honest, I was already living in Canada and it was a plan that we, uh, we've been developing since I moved here. Um, and I think that considering the aspects of expansion globally, um, it is still a good idea to expand globally for my business. I, my, for those of you who don't know my company, I work basically with enterprise software. Um, so in my case, it, I, the business has changed and actually has increased a little bit because it's a cloud-based platform and with everyone working at home that end up being a big factor. Uh, with people actually like uh, adherence as well. So the same way that Raquel was talking about how people didn't want to really do in uh, online meetings and all they do with cloud software, they really didn't trust it that much. And now they kind of have to <laughs> because that's the only way they can access their documents, right? Um, so with that, I think we didn't change our strategy because it was planned for many years with regardless of the pandemic or not. It's important to say that also, we also, we always work with a, low cost operation and that was one of my focus so we had enough profit in brazil to do the development development even though the economic situation in brazil is a little bit unstable so that created advantages for us in a case of the pandemic where we still have that engage like that money to invest or to if like any clients got out or anything like that we had room to play with in that sense yeah, that's really good. In your case, you were already here. Uh, I know, Beatrice, you also, you were already here. Uh, but uh, there are moments that you really are missing your family or you're missing more support around you. Uh, what was your motivation behind, Beatrice, to stay and keep going with your company and things that were happening here? Uh, that's pretty easy, Miriam. Uh, my motivation is because our mission is so clear. Uh, with light touch and what we want to do, which is, and now, especially now with the pandemic, uh, for the people that don't know, we have a solution that helps to um, empower children with social emotional learning. So we help to develop emotional intelligence, measure and develop emotional intelligence. So our mission, and not just because I'm a mom, but I think we have such a beautiful mission behind it. And especially now in the pandemic, that's where the kids, if we are struggling as adults, Imagine the kids who don't have much knowledge of what's actually going on. They just hear about this mysterious virus and you can't hug anymore. You can't do, you know. So uh, our mission is so clear that I'll give everything I have. I'll do and I'll go through 10 other pandemics if necessary to get my goal um, of thriving with light touch. It's something that goes beyond my, you know, just any personal, it, it goes beyond. I, I have to do this. So Right. Now, that, that's a really good answer. Also, Beatriz. Uh, Juliana, what was your case? Um, you also uh, were just uh, um, just starting with the, the whole situation. So what was your motivation to continue? Well, uh, my situation was like, uh, uh, was like, oh, I, sorry. Uh, my, my, my situation was like, a tra like, a Discovered because uh, we, it was my time in Canada. Uh, we to, to everyone here. So if you, if you have like uh, uh, for employee, uh, government Canada is going to help you all the time. So I just discovered. I just found. I just found found out uh, this situation. I, and I think uh, for me at least uh, makes me to help uh, to make the, the the decision to stay here. 
Thank you, Juliana. And um, uh, Raquel, uh, in your case, uh, you were uh, with Atimos and you were also helping other companies. Uh, what was your motivation? You, you were already with the permanent residence for sure, but you were alone here with your kids. So um, what, what keep you uh, going with your business? I think maybe it's my entrepreneurship passion that's in my DNA. I love innovate uh, and create new things and develop projects that are gonna help other people. Uh, with Atimus uh, Save Lives, with uh, projects that I'm guiding now, developing skills and helping people to bring their business to Canada. So, uh, I don't know, when we are parents uh, and we are more mature, we know that uh, our life has to have to be a purpose. Uh, we, we have to spend our time with things that we are really valuable for us. And so the, the, the projects that I'm committed really bring me passion and involvement. And this gives me energy to continue. I think if you, if you do things that you love and you believe, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's, that's uh, totally true. Um, okay, so ladies, uh, I want to uh, remind the audience that if you have questions for uh, uh, you know, any of the, uh, our guests today, you can post it in, in the chat box or you can open your microphone. I will continue with some questions until the point that we can actually open uh, you know, for questions for, uh, for people. But if you want to you know, ask questions, so go ahead. Uh, the next question is more regarding about the news. We have seen in the news a lot that, uh, you know, women entrepreneur has been, or women in general, has been more impacted by the pandemic in regards that, you know, um, uh, there are too many women uh, losing jobs, uh, dedicating their homes, uh, their business are more likely to close. Um, what do you think about those statistics and what they can do in order to maybe, uh, you know, create a, a, a strategy or, or, or make sure that their business are not closing? Uh, what, what are the type of support do you think uh, that that woman in general will need during the circumstances that, that we are seeing right now? And I will let it open to any of the four of you that want to speak. I want to I wanna make a comment that might drive, help drive the discussion a little bit, that it was something I heard uh, in one of, like, I think one or two weeks ago. I was talking to another uh, entrepreneur, he's a male entrepreneur, and I was talking about how hard the pandemic is, right? And especially... I know that this person has kids at home. So it's like, that must be hard. And the take that took me by surprise, uh, mind you, I don't have kids, so I can't speak personally to this, but the thing that took me by surprise, like, yes, it's very hard on my wife. And I know, well, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I would think the other people here might be uh, a little bit more, uh, like regarding the, the mom, especially because I don't have a kid at home, but I think that helps us understand a little bit where a lot of this is coming from, especially for women having to leave their businesses or sometimes having to choose between careers. And when we consider the pay gap as well, right? The pay gap is still a reality. So when you look, if you have to have someone at home and depending on the couples that I've heard, I've talked about they choose usually the one that earns less money or to stay with a kid at home or take that responsibility. And that usually ends up being the woman. So that's, that's my collaboration for this, for this topic. Unfortunately, that's kind of true, you know, with pandemic or without pandemic, <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of true. Uh, Beatriz, you're a mom. Uh, what do you think about that in particular and how a woman can cope, uh, you know, or uh, what are the type of help that you think uh, that, that they need, especially if they are entrepreneurs right now? Um, I would say a lot of um, positive, I think you have to focus on the positive and try to enjoy the moments that you have your kid at home with, like at the moments you have, although it's kind of hard because you just want to go out to the, you know, the balcony and scream for five minutes and like, help me get me out of here. But uh, I try to always look on the bright side. But I can like I I'm I also have a really great partner at home. My husband helps me out. Like I don't even like to say the word help because it's his responsibility too. So he doesn't help me. We help each other. So um, I have a really great partner at home. Uh, so we have a really good um, balance between that. But it's 
it ends up always being harder on the woman, especially um, being into in, in an entrepreneur in all aspects. I mean, but I think we're actually also kind of gifted in that aspect. We're kind of octopuses, mom. We're women, we, we can handle, juggle many plates at the same time. We have, I think it's something of the feminine. I don't, I'm not sure, but I, I would say that we have this specific um, plus point that we are able to do those activities while the men has more like a direct kind of view. I think we're kind of, I, I see that as a blessing, but sometimes it comes as a curse because we can manage many things. So they're just like, okay, she can do it. But you know, let's, it's also us up to us to impose the limits as well. So I'm very clear on that. So if I need to take a time for myself, I'm like, I'm going out for a walk and I'm going. So, you know, you have to, you have to put your limits as well. Yeah, and I agree uh, with you on that. Like, uh, you know, people tend to think you can do many things at the same time and, you know, this is okay. So this is one more thing that you can do. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. in, in, yeah, <laughs> that's totally true. Uh, Raquel, in your case, uh, you also have a kid, but you are kind of the sole responsible for, for that home. Uh, what do you think that, you know, what, what type of help uh, do you think uh, during these difficult circumstances, like uh, women entrepreneurs will need in this, uh, this time of, uh, you know, during the pandemic, after pandemic, there are too many businesses that, that need to be rebuilt. Uh, so what is your opinion about that? Great question, Miriam. Um, I agree with the group related uh, to our multicultural uh, uh, multidisciplinary skills, but I think we develop that because we don't have a choice. Um, so we we do have the responsibilities at home, and then you have things to to do at work. So we choose to do this, and we develop these skills as the men can do it too. So, um, what I think women could um, be helped during the pandemic, and also uh, during all time, I think is in hasty discussion and really open um, at more gender equality. Uh, in the companies and also qualify kids and educate kids with um, support to um, develop their leaders, leadership skills, technical skills that usually everybody thinks it's for boys, for example, coding classes, uh, computer classes, things that in general used to be uh, uh, majority men, but that's not the case anymore. We can be engineers, we can pilot airplanes, we can do uh, we can do whatever we want as the men can do too. But um, we have to open these possibilities. I've been guiding some entrepreneurs now to connect with the mining industry, and it's a it's a sector that's complete, almost 100% men. If you think about their suppliers, only 1% are, are women-led business. Uh, so how can we open doors? Um, it's to rethink, they have to rethink their procurement programs. They have to think possibilities, how they can, more, they can be more flexible to open opportunity for women entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and that it's not a feminist discussion. That's not uh, something that I, I used to, not to like this kind of things because I'm an entrepreneur for 20 years and I was doing by myself. I didn't need anybody helping me there. But I know that in sectors that are majority male, it's really difficult to start the process and go to the C-level and, and have high level positions. So for sure, we have to open these discussions as we are doing today and um, try to find ways to open these doors and give the first opportunity. And then when they are there, they are going to see that it's much more sustainable. They are going to have more innovation with different eyes, different ways to do business. And this is going to be more profitable and it's going to have more results. That's, that's a really good answer. Thank you so much, uh, Raquel. Uh, Juliana, uh, what is your perspective on this topic? Uh, do you think uh, yeah, like a woman-led businesses have been more 
affected by the pandemic has been more difficult for a woman to actually navigate this time of the, you know, all these troubling times for, for women entrepreneurs? Well, besides uh, that the, all the information that uh, everyone said here, like uh, positive and resilience, I think uh, the key for me at least is, uh, is have a, like a, a good team. You know, I mean, like when you have a lot of uh, communication and a good communication with your team, and with your partner, uh, I, I think this is a great opportunity to develop a, a great, um, to, de to develop a great, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I think, uh, well, for me, at least it's going, it's going to be the, the best uh, opportunity to to, to do and to success, to success in your company. Okay, that, that's, that's important too, because people has to see, you know, the, the bright light also in, in this part, you know, sometimes uh, you probably uh, will be able to communicate better with your partners and, and to actually, uh, you know, do better during this time for sure. Uh, try to also emphasize that how difficult can be for you, you know, with your partners. And I hear uh, in the chat have a very good comment from Priscilla. This is your sister, Beatriz. Uh, she's your co-founder as well. Uh, but uh, she, she's, uh, she put different questions here uh, that, you know, in per one of the questions is really um, one of the most, uh, I say, the most topics that people talk during this type of events is about how to navigate uh, in this male-oriented, sometimes um, uh, you know, sector that is the technology sector. Do you feel different uh, when you are working in this sector? Do you feel like uh, uh, that people are treating you different um, than you know males in the same sector? What is your experience in that part? Because sometimes uh, I hear some women saying, "Yeah, this is." This is very hard to navigate. Some others say, well, that's, that's not really the case. What is your experience on that? We'll start with Beatrice. Well, Miriam, the difference is there and it exists, unfortunately. Um, that's why there's so many incentives and programs to for female founders you know, to stimulate the programs. I, I believe Canada has a, although we get very much less investments rather than male companies, um, if we're talking about sex differences, then uh, it, it, it does exist. But one thing that um, I don't know if it was my upbringing, the way I was raised, um, I really like the sentence that it's like, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. So I never give the consent to feel inferior, you know? So it comes from you. If you allow that to happen, then they're gonna do it for you. They're gonna do it to you. So that's something on my personal, um, the way of behaving. Um, it's okay to not know everything. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to say, I, I don't know that. I'll ask, I'll go for the answer. But um, the difference exists, unfortunately, but it's, it's much more from us to position ourselves and rather we are gonna be allowed to see, be seen as inferior or not. And I'm not, so that's, that's very much powerful. That's very powerful, yeah. Beatrice. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Um, uh, Juliana, what is your perspective on that? Uh, it has been difficult for you. Do you feel any difference, uh, you know, working as a woman or, uh, or not in technology? Juliana, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, well, this is totally new for me. I was uh, in another industry before I, I came here to, to Canada, uh, but well, you know, the, I mean, when I speak with someone, uh, they doesn't uh, focus on gender. Uh, they just focus on the product that you are selling or, or they also are, are focusing your attraction that you have made. So sometimes it's challenge, yes, but I think the opportunity that we have uh, over here and in Canada has been a lot of uh, su successful, successful for us and for our careers. So it it's, it's all depends uh, for the size you, you see uh, the opportunity. So I mean, so if you are positive, you are, gonna, uh, you are going to do uh, everything okay. So this is the important thing, be, be positive all the time. Yeah, thank you, Juliana. Uh, Ingrid, how, how, was, how, how is your experience in this area? Work? Well, I think 
<laughs> uh, first of all, I'm in soft, uh, enterprise software, right? So it's a very do male dominated industry in tech. Um, I think there's two aspects to it. First of all, I'm 25 and I started my company at 20. So a woman and also very young, right? Um, and I've seen, and well, the data shows it, right? Like programs like Artemis that Raquel talked about and data on venture capitalists and all that shows that we do still have a lot of uh, gender differences when it comes to the market, be corporate or be startups, right? Um, and I think that my experience personally, it has been more, I, I agree a lot and I'm, I have the same visions as Beatrice in the sense that like, I do take a stance to be more assertive and by being more assertive, I diminish the microaggressions, but they still exist. So I think there's a there's two things to play there. I see a lot of women having difficulty speaking up because they weren't taught since they were young to speak up and talk about what they need. And then you encounter that with the like common male corporate person that doesn't really understand that language or doesn't really want to understand that language and be more inclusive. And then you create those kind of like not really wanting to help. One example that um, one, one study shows is that men really don't feel comfortable giving women feedback because they don't know how they would react. So like those kind of like minor things, but then in the, in the long run, it does affect women a lot, right? And then when we talk, so about my experience in enterprise software, it's, it is different. I deal with a lot of men and I'm just used to it. It helps that I was raised, raised by a civil engineer they got her degree like when she was the only woman in the field. So it's kind of like, it was like an extension from that. Uh, but it's still, it's uh, challenging in the sense that I have to sometimes change my pos posture, change my voice, be careful with what I say. Um, always be aware of like, if there's any weird comment or like, you know, like towards woman or something like that and be very, calm and collected in our like in my replies or in the way that I speak to people so I think there's a bigger awareness in the sense that I need to react I need to talk in the business world in that sense that not necessarily all men are aware of yeah that's that's very important uh Ingrid and um I think in general uh is increasing a sensibility uh, you know around how we talk with other people, uh, not just about gender, but also about also about uh, you know racism, uh, about you know um, about being, for example, an immigrant or not, being black or not. Uh, you know, it has been kind of in the last years uh, becoming more and more sensitive the way that we communicate to others, and we need to be more mindful. I think right now because there is a lot of uh, cultural cancellation around <laughs> this part and uh, yeah so so I think that you know the world is becoming more uh, you know aware about you know how to talk with other people and, and we we need us also as women be mindful about how we uh, communicate with them so they are not afraid to talk with us that that's very important uh, and Raquel already gave some uh, answers regarding this question but I have a here a good question from Victor Thank you, Victor, and thank you, uh, Rafael, for, for your comments in the chat. Um, so Victor has a question. I will start with Raquel. When, and, uh, when or why did you decide to be entrepreneurs? And what are the barriers that you still uh, have to be, uh, you know, going through as a, to have more women entrepreneurs? And this is a good question because I get this ask all the time by the government is why you don't have more women entrepreneurs, you know, or how many women entrepreneurs are, but really we don't get that many women entrepreneurs in the market, especially in tech. So uh, Raquel, uh, what is your answer about, you know, why did you decide to uh, become an entrepreneur? Thank you, Victor, for the question. Well, I decided to become an entrepreneur since I was at the university, I knew that I want to make the difference and bring different perspectives. Um, I was in the journalism uh, faculty, actually in the course of journalism and communication, and the all the professors were actually preparing us to become employees. 
And I had um, huge discussions about this topic because I was always asking, why not become an entrepreneur? And they were just saying, no, there are only big newspapers and <laughs> you're not going to be able to do it. I was really upset about how they were not prepared to, to actually qualify us to become entrepreneurs. There was no preparation for that at the time in the university now. We have, we have incubators, we have a lot of other kinds of uh, preparation for leadership skills, but in that time not. But I was working in a multinational company that's called uh, Grupo Gerdau. It's one of the most uh, serious and respected company in Brazil in that time. And my director uh, said to me that I have uh, DNA, uh, entrepreneurship DNA, and that I, I should open a company and they would be one of my clients. So what I did, I, I actually trusted in, in my feeling, in my actually desire to become an entrepreneur with a good opportunity. And what I think that other entrepreneur, other women might not do is actually to believe in themselves that they can do it that it's possible, it's not easy because we oscillate, we don't have like a salary every month. In the first two years, I was just investing in my company. I had to pay electricity with coins with my partner. So uh, all, the, all the things we, we bought for our business was with our clients uh, actually uh, profit and all the things that we We've learned with each other working. I was I didn't have any kind of investment to do at the time. So, so it's possible to do without a lot of money, but you have to trust that that is your path that you really want to do. Otherwise, it's much easier or comfortable when you are an employee, you, you have to actually deliver your services. You have to uh, be guided as with another purpose from another person and not yours, from the company that you are serving to. So it's a choice. Uh, and uh, some people are not, they don't want that and that's okay. But if uh, for me, it, I think I, I, was, I was since very young, uh, prepare to become an entrepreneur. That, that's, a, that's a really nice story. And I think uh, I hear that many times when, uh, you know, uh, many people have been prepared to be employees, but not really entrepreneurs. And that, you know, kind of goes sometimes in the blood. Um, Juliana, how has it been for you? Because you, you came from a different type of career and now you're an entrepreneur. So when, when you know, did you decide this was the path for you? Well, at the beginning, I have to be honest, I wasn't sure to, to do this. I, I was like, I, I was having a lot of concerns, but now I think it's a great opportunity to meet a lot of people. Uh, it's a different path to life. So for me it has been uh, be, uh, very different. Uh, you know, as Raquel was saying, when you are employed, you just have to do the things that they put you on, nothing else. But but this career, uh, which I take, uh, I have to do every every day. I have to reinvent myself. I have to do every 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 everything that I uh, do. Uh, at least sometimes I, I'm not sure if I'm going, uh, if I am doing the, the right thing, but I have just to believe in myself. And, and I think this is have a very successful, very successful for me because have, have me uh, help to help me to, to understand that I am doing the right thing. That's a beautiful, yeah, that's, that's you know, uh, happened to many people that, you know, when they experience entrepreneurship, then they really want to continue. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure this is one of your many ventures that you are going to have <laughs> because entrepreneurs, we tend to have many types of companies. Ingrid, uh, when was the time that you decided that this was your thing, become an entrepreneur? Um, so I started our company when I was finishing my bachelor's, right? My first bachelor's. 
And it was quite interesting because I did business administration in a way that I wanted to work in a corporate role than work in marketing. And then I started doing internships on those companies that I thought it was going to be my path. Uh, big companies like SAP, General Electric, and I never really fit in. Like I would work there for six months, like, okay, next one. <laughs> Let's see if I can find somewhere that I really belong. And that kind of thing uh, never sit well with me with regards to like never being able to make changes or like make something happen because everything was so structured up and down that it was very hard to like develop new ideas. Um, so then we started, we actually started with the project with Safety Dogs when I was still working in one of those companies. I, look, I worked as um, a business uh, intelligence analyst at Luxottica, so Oakley. And I was doing that while doing like all this other exciting stuff on the side. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take the leap. So I got our first client. I got out of that internship and then been working on it since then. It was a little bit of a, it, it was a little bit weird. I don't know how it works exactly in Canada, but in our country, at least there's this pressure when you're in the last year of university to really find your analyst job and stay there and like get a good corporate job. Right. There's still like that kind of environment. And I, I got a little bit insecure because of that, because I was leaving a good, secure job to pursue that career, right? But end up being pretty okay. So I can't complain there. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Beatriz, uh, when was your time that, you know, you feel like that this was your career? Well, I've had a few um, businesses, Miriam. I did discover entrepreneurship when I was uh, graduate, graduating university. Uh, it was my first experience. And then I was just like, hmm, is this um, really my path? Because I, the, the, the place, the surroundings that I was born in was just like just a regular you job. You have a company, you have like 40 years of um, my parent, my dad worked 40 years in the same company. So I was just like, hmm, is that the correct way of doing it? Is there a right or wrong? So I felt kind of guilty not following the same steps. But then also I'm a very dynamic person. So I saw, I noticed that with the entrepreneurial world, we can be um, there, we have to be dynamic. We have to do many things in different aspects. And I found out that I am a entrepreneur by essence. And so that's not, you know, Light Touch is not my first business. I had a few successful businesses as well. So due to that, and I had the luck, I, I mean, it was lucky for, I, for me to have found that out early. I was still in the, comfort of my parents' home. So I didn't have, you know, bills to pay. So I could discover that within me very early. So I feel very blessed for that. Um, but it's, I think it's a path that hardly people go and turn back to the regular job. I really would like to hear a story that people that would just, oh no, I'm going back to the regular job. I really find it hard to believe, but um, it, it's always exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah, I agree. I've been in this path for over 20 years. and <laughs> never wanted to come back to the corporate world. Uh, but that, that's not, I don't know, maybe somebody has a different case. Uh, so I will have just three questions because I have one from Rafael here, uh, one to wrap up uh, and basically uh, some probably recommendations for people that are putting business right now. Uh, so some of them that are, you know, thinking this uh, situation is very difficult, so what to do. But I'll go first with the, with the question uh, that Rafael has here. So do you think that some barriers that women face in the workplace or interacting with male counterparts or clients will decrease uh, in this virtual world uh, because there is less human interaction or biases that occur perhaps via digital inter interaction? Uh, any thoughts? Um, so Juliana, do you think this is going to be, uh, you know, uh, be less this type of problems uh, being in a virtual world right now? Well, nowadays, I think uh, people doesn't have any problem with virtual uh, stuff because, you know, one of the things is that uh, when you are going to do a virtual um, interview or something you are uh saving some time so i i think the virtual uh circumstances is going to uh help us with meet a lot of people uh do a more thing that we were expecting okay good uh what about you raquel do you think that uh you know the barriers that a uh, woman uh, perhaps uh perceiving the the normal world is, is are going to be away during the virtual uh, you know, world that we are living right now? 
at least some of the barriers it's possible, for example, sexual harassment and uh, any kind of uh, um, abuses that happens in the workplace. Maybe these kind of things in an online environment are going to be reduced. Um, but there are things that are cultural uh, uh, that are not going to reduce because of the environment that we are connected. Um, I don't believe that the channel is going to change uh, the position that we are nowadays. I think it's uh, much more discussion related to that and open space, as I, as I said before. Yeah, thank you, Raquel. What is your opinion, Ingrid? Um, I don't believe that's the problem at all. I, I'm actually going to recommend a book. I'm going to write it down here in the chat. Uh, it's called That's What She Said by Juana. And she actually goes in depth with all our, which are all the barriers by studies shown for women in corporate positions, and especially working in male dominated fields. Um, and we see, for example, just citing one couple of studies that uh, when they research, especially with like HR professionals, um, when they give them the same curriculum, kind of the same curriculum and the same experience with the name of a man and the name of a woman, you don't have the human interaction there, but they still tend to find reasons and find reasons to choose the man, even though they have very much similar curriculums, but they just change the wording a little bit. So there's a lot of cases in that scenario that unfortunately I would hope that the virtual changed a little bit of it, but the problems go way deeper than that, unfortunately. Okay, and um, Beatrice, your opinion on that? I would just agree with everything that she said. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Beatrice, in the virtual say, and actual, I think it's still now. It's this still is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a difficult question here uh, because uh, you know um, there is a, a big controversy over the years about feminism. Uh, some uh, people, uh, even you know, women, agree to be uh, you know more a feminist. Some others are considered not feminist. And during this month, there is always, you know, uh, conversations around that, and you know, uh, of course around, uh, you know, women entrepreneurs. And I, I always follow people, uh, you know, that are leaders in the market that that probably have very controversial uh, views about different things. And um, that that kind of uh, personally helped me to, uh, you know, visualize different things that different beliefs that I, that I have. I, I always like to hear. Um, different stories that the ones that are that I hear around me and and this lady she posted I'm not a girl boss mompreneur social media babe as someone um, uh, once called me I'm a founder and I'm business owner in my own right and by using uh, genderizing titles we acknowledge um, the, the, the legitimized woman leadership what do you think about that? Uh, is though is actually that those titles are uh, are putting more barriers than than before? How do you feel about you know these controversial issues? Uh, I will start with Beatrice. Miriam, that's pretty hard for me to answer because I'm uh, one of. It's funny because one of my emails I even sign mom and founder. So but not because I want to be considered anything. It's just because I'm so proud of being a female founder. I'm so proud of everything I've been achieving. Me and my co-founder Priscilla, we are so proud of everything that we've been going through. Then for me, it doesn't reduce any quality in what I do. And I'm proudly a female founder. So for me, that wouldn't be an issue at all. And I do sign a few emails when I'm talking to other parents regarding our business. I do sign it mom and founder, co-founder, actually. That's so, good. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. No, everybody has a different opinion. That's why I wanted to uh, ask you, ladies. What about you, Juliana? What do you feel about those uh, titles, uh, you know, around uh, female founders? Well, actually, I, I'm not a mom. <laughs> But, uh, well, I think it's different. Well, everyone have a different thoughts. So I, well, when you say that, I think every woman should, uh, shouldn't should like uh, be concerned about that because, you know, when you, when you are 
right, doing the right things and you believe in yourself, that's the important thing that you have to do, believe in yourself. Okay, thank you, Juliana. What about you, Ingrid? How do you feel about that comment in particular? <laughs> Um, I will divide the answer in two parts because I do agree with Beatrice. I'm not a, mon a mom as well, but I do agree with Beatrice in the sense that um, I don't think we should be, women that wanted to identify as a mother shouldn't be ashamed or degraded by that. But when we talk about girl boss and terms like that, it takes a take of inf inf infantilization of women that I don't appreciate. So whenever like, there's a lot of, I do a master's in intercultural international communications, right? So when we study even journals or the way that they talk about women in the media, it's always like woman politician or woman referee or not, not just the profession. So why do we still like that kind of thing? And the words that follow describing those, those women are usually way more progratory than they are the same when you compare two articles written by men. So that's something that we should be aware of. So I don't think, I don't like the infant, infantilization of the girl boss term and also how that became a thing, especially in the MLM world. <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. But just to be aware of that in the sense that they use women that um, need money and usually are like a stay at home moms in order to get them to participate in those programs and make make profit out of it. So those are the two, the two different takes that I have on it. Got it. Uh, Raquel, what do you feel about those comments coming uh, for, uh, from another woman that has a different perspective on this? I agree with Ingrid. Um, I, want to be, I want to be an entrepreneur, respected entrepreneur and successful entrepreneur, independently to be a woman. I mean, uh, I don't want to compare with other women or for other men. I just want to be a great entrepreneur. Uh, and have a great and successful business. Um, when you put this title, you are, com you are saying that, okay, she achieved her goal. She's a female entrepreneur. She's, she's among this group that achieved. No, I am among the bigger group. Uh, why, why I have to be divided? I think we can, we can work together. <laughs> um, so I... I don't think that's a positive um, way to connect with business. I have an example, for example, um, a client of mine received a very important award recently. And uh, when they we wrote about her, they emphasize her gender, actually, uh, um, characteristic and uh, how she was uh, working uh, during this journey, all the battles that she uh, struggled during this time to achieve her goals. But actually she wanted to be recognized as a business strategist in what she has been doing as a professional, not as a woman or not, not as a um, someone that was, um, doing a female movement she wanted to because she received the award because of her work because of her business not because of her female leadership so she was really upset she said okay the award is amazing but what they wrote about me was not exactly what i was waiting for and this is not good for my business because my clients that are male are going to see me as someone that's like criticizing them or doing a movement to to put only female in leadership maybe they're gonna have like a bad um, feeling when they read this because they i want them to recognize me as a business strategy someone that are gonna give them good results so this kind of comment maybe it's not good and positive even for us Okay, uh, good. That's that's a very different point of view. And Beatrice, do you uh, do you have something to say? And we need to wrap up. I'm sorry for the uh, of the person uh, or Olune that that you are asking questions here, but we are kind of over the time. But Beatrice, uh, do you want to have uh, uh, an opinion on this? Yeah. Uh, just to compliment, uh, I do not disagree with the girls. I 
just think that the difference exists, it's there and we know it. But when we are um, building, when I tell myself, when I um, acknowledge myself as a female founder, I'm more uh, easily going to be found by other women that are scared to do that because the business was dominated by men and we all know that. So it's a way of opening uh, new doors to other women who are scared to do that. So it's a way that we can even open doors, connect and just go beyond. And maybe my daughter won't have that issue when she grows up and she's in the business um, uh, after, you know, when she decides to be an entrepreneur. So I think that's the most important thing we can focus. I'm, I'm proudly a female founder. And I say that with, you know, all the energy that I have and all the love in that I have. And I use that in favor as what we're doing here to if there's any other women out there that's looking to, you know, incorporate a business and is afraid to do so, there are good examples that it can work because also because we're female as well. It, it doesn't have to be fa fa male or female. I mean, we can do it. So it's a way of opening doors to empower each other. That's what we need to do, I guess. So I compliment my answer with both of the girls, what they said. Yeah, that, that's a, yeah, that's a, again, everybody has a different point of view on this. And it also uh, related a lot with the experience uh, that you have as, uh, you know, growing as, you know, and, and becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, for example, in my case, my mom was an entrepreneur. So I didn't feel like, uh, you know, I need, a, I need another example. It's, <laughs> I, I had a, the best example that I could have, <laughs> having my mom destroying and building companies because that that was kind of the uh, the cycle always now to wrap up ladies i just need one phrase one phrase because we are over the time we're five minutes over the time uh just to uh give uh, your takeaways about being an entrepreneur and how what will be your best advice for people that are starting business or growing business during the pandemic so i will start with ingrid what what is your best advice for them I would say be careful with communication, social media, and language. I can't stress this enough, especially for starting a business. That's super true. I, I wasn't expecting that, but it's super true. Beatriz, what is your best advice for them? I would say do it. If you have the gut feeling that you can make a change with something that's like itching in the back of your head, just go for it. When we have passion, the, the way to success is much easier for what we're doing it's true it's true uh juliana what is your best advice for them i would say enjoy every do that you do and do your best and raquel uh what is your advice for uh, for people that are becoming entrepreneurs in these difficult times and they want to grow their business I would say believe in yourself and in your business, create uh, strategic partnerships and choose the right partners. The team is really important to enhance your business and divide responsibilities to achieve your goals. That's super true about the team too. That, that's really important. So, sometimes people are like a teaming up with their best friend, but they, they are not sometimes the best partner. <laughs> it, it depends, you know, like uh, we, we have seen too many uh, type of uh, teams. But ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. This was like uh, our very first uh, Choose Female uh, webinar that, that we are doing for, uh, you know, for this special occasion in March you know, uh, highlighting the uh, importance uh, of uh, women entrepreneurs as well, you know, the stories behind, because uh, I think it's, it's important to have those stories behind. So everybody have a really great time, uh, you know, today, I hope this uh, information and these insights from them will help them. And of course, this video will be shared, you know, uh, in social media, so you can connect with uh, Ingrid, Beatriz, Juliana, and um, Raquel in LinkedIn and maybe have more conversations ahead, okay? Thank you, everyone. Thank you.